Welcome to another episode of the Stratocast as we look back at Manchester United's 1-0 win over Copenhagen. Old Trafford's tribute to Sir Bobby Charlton and Harry Maguire's redemption. That and more in episode 176. Brian, delighted to be joined by you again. Speaking to us after a heavy trip to Bramall Lane. Laughing whilst editing the podcast, I'm sure listeners kind of heard it too, that as the, the trip progressed, great form before the game, and listening to you in Manchester Airport, sounded like you are held hostage by Bane. Yeah, it was um, it was the vocal dis- the vocal um, display of what actually happened on the weekend, so obviously full of pre-match excitement and everything's going great, and uh, yeah, then the alcohol gets on board, and a little bit more gets on board, and then you hit the ground and obviously you're singing and chanting for an hour and a half and you come out like you're after smoking 400 fags. So it was a... Uh, deterioration. Was, yeah, a, a, a swift deterioration. Yeah, exactly. Good crack though. Looking on, before we get to last night's match in the Champions League, I want to obviously touch on Sir Bobby Charles passing away this week, aged 86. Truly iconic figure, recognised across the world. He's one of nine players in history to win the European Cup, World Cup and the Ballon d'Or. Do you think though anyone compares to him in terms of former players that epitomise Manchester United? To be fair, Dale, I, I think he's at the top of the, at the top of the chain there. I think he's the one that, if you look at the club and the history of the club and everything's gone on through the, through the days of back in the Busby Babes and all that, you know, I mean, he's... The longevity of the effect he's had in the club is is massive. General impression he made in the club from from day one. He, it's just it stuck till the day he left us. So an iconic figure. I don't think you could pick too many more com- comparing what he achieved at the club as well. I don't think you could put many more on the pedestal beside him. We don't credit the club a lot, but when sad stories like this break of of club legends passing, they usually do things right. And I thought the tribute before the Copenhagen game was really, really good. I thought the Copenhagen fans were class as well. Obviously, bringing their own hand at Med Banner, a tribute to Bobby Charlton, and singing his name as well. All kind of fitted in nicely. But what I wanted to touch on as well was something Harry Maguire mentioned at the weekend after the win over Sheffield United. And he said that this news, as it flooded through, really affected the team. And he kind of spoke about like Bobby Charlton's presence around the club. We both touched on how he epitomises the club, but properly part of the furniture in a sense that came through the youth academy. Then the tragedy of watching his friends die on the runway, coming back, being part of the rebuild of the club, moving on to be a director. A great player, but you'd have to say a, a better man or a greater man. Yeah, and I mean, like you said, the, the, the tribute he got from the Copenhagen fans shows what kind of person and the kind of effect he had in football overall, not just to Manchester United, so... His legend precedes him. He's achieved so much in the game that he, like the tributes from other clubs was, was unreal. I think Bayern, Barcelona, a couple of really, really big footballing giants paying tribute to him. It's it's when you see that kind of a, a reaction to someone's news of passing that you can kind of get the, the depth of the effect he's made on, on football overall. It's kind of mad really to think that one person can achieve so much at a club from such a young age and keep going all those years until the very, very end. To become part of as the furniture, as you said. So yeah, I'm sure that the news when it came through probably did affect him quite a lot in fairness to the team because I mean, a lot of them will have been used to seeing him around the place, and then obviously like especially the England lads too, lads yeah, exactly. in the England yeah. squad, yeah. they would have seen him a lot more as well. He's embedded in in the foundations of, of the the ground inside. I mean, you're not going to walk around the ground without seeing some reference to him. So I can imagine that news didn't come any great. Um, Positive impact on, on the team, to be fair. Like going to a game rent and I'd imagine it would have it would have drawn him back mentally before that game. The game itself against Copenhagen was poor to watch, especially in terms of performance. The first half was absolutely dire. But the second half was full of drama. Do you think United have a problem in terms of starting games on the front foot? <laughs> what don't we have a problem with at the moment is a better question, I suppose. But I don't know, we're just such a fucking straight we're such a strange side this season like we've had games where we've gone out and we've been really really good for like 20 minutes the ongoing joke of oh 20 minutes in man united are dominating possession seven shots on target they're down one nil so it's a kind of been a strange start to the season that way yeah I, oh, jesus Dale, i don't know what's going on at the moment like we're we're just putrid to watch you, you see the problem i'm getting with this question especially the game against copenhagen 
and I've seen people at games complaining about this a lot is that our centre backs are bringing the ball out the fence, stop at the halfway line. It's all walk and pace. And I don't know is the matter either of is it the movement of the front three or is it just we're playing with such a slow tempo? What is it? Because I heard a clip on one of United's socials feeds this morning of Johnny Evans and Mason Mount talking about their favourite United chance. I know Mount hasn't been around for a very long time, so he probably doesn't know a lot of them, but the one he picked was attack, attack, attack. And his comment was, it makes you want to attack. And I'm there listening, thinking, this team, I don't see that, especially in the first half of games where it's walking pace. It's probably my biggest gripe at the moment around the team's performance is that pedestrian really really slow bro- broken down football where you're passing it left passing it right along the back four maybe pick a little pass into the middle to one of the center mids which comes straight back at you again and if harry Maguire is playing most of the time it ends up back to harry Maguire's feet because he's probably one of the boys that can pick a pass but we either boot it left or right wing and it comes back again or he tries to ping one to an, a, a runner will say like fracture makes a run or whatever but then again it's kind of a hit and hope ball because you know, how many times are they going to come off? The style is just fucking, it's horrible. It's so, so horrible to watch. It's just been reduced to this really... i seen someone out. compare it last night to Van Gaal. I was just about to say Van Gaal, to be honest, yeah. It's just, he had a very similar, boring as fuck way of playing football where you just pass it around the back and try and pick a pass from, from centre half out. It's dreadful to watch i mean we don't have any style of play at all i mean i don't even think you can call that a style it's just shit but like we don't have a style of play this season whatever is after happening it's it's obviously comes down to the manager and that's that's calling a spade a spade but like he started the season wanted to play these inverted fullback system and his new style of play and whatever else the boys in the middle pushing out and all these little plans but then we got forty-seven thousand injuries and it looks like he just can't seem to pick what style to play with what he has? Maybe I don't. I don't know what he's what the mindset. You do not think with the thing you touched on with fullbacks that he's very much sticking to that, regardless of who's available on the podcast yeah. the weekend. One of the observations he picked up on was Lindelof's position and how and how he's pretty much everywhere. And I was listening, thinking, but anyone that's playing in that fullback role for United this season, that is the role that they're carrying out. Yeah, like if I had one criticism to aim at Ten Hag, it's, it's stubbornness. And his stubbornness is a refusal to change system or a refusal to change his, his method of substitutions or when he does what. He is, or the biggest one, rotation, which doesn't exist obviously under him. He's going to play every player, every game he wants with the same players. He is stubborn to a fault. And I just wonder, maybe you're right in that, that he's just, is he just too stubborn to try and change it and he's just accepting the players he has and he's making them try to work to that system because that's the system they'll have to come into, I'd imagine, yeah. afterwards anyway, which is a fair enough show. But, I mean, you have to adapt. You have to adapt. As a manager, you have to adapt to the situation you're in. And I'm not anyone to tell Eric Ten Hag what decisions to make, but if I was the man in charge, you accept the players you have at the time and you play the kind of style of football that's going to suit them. It may not be your inverted fullback, ticky-tacky, passing around the middle. It may be a more conventional style. But you do what you have to do. and I mean, what we're doing at the moment isn't working. We're getting a couple of results, but performance-wise, it's fucking horrific. I mean, no one really wants to be watching us playing this bad. I doubt the players are enjoying playing shit every week. So it's it's a tricky one. I do think it's a system because the comparison that I'd make in, in recent memory would be Liverpool a year or two ago when they got um, an array of bad injuries in the squad. When that happened, I remember sections of the press were going in really hard on clock because the results were awful and they weren't picking up and they were questioning the squad selections and kind of similarly players playing in different roles that weren't as good as the players that were out of injury and he just stuck to that system because that's what that's what he plays and he he did so stubbornly i think that's what we're seeing with ten Hag. i don't think he sat there on, on the touchline although he might come out publicly after a game and say that he's happy with the performance. I think there's two ways to look at it. People will definitely side, Some people will definitely side with you saying that you have to adapt because certain managers will do that. 
Car- the likes of Carlo Ancelotti is is, is renowned in, in world football for for adapting depending on the squad that he has available to him, and he'll find players for the best roles. I don't think Ten Hag is one of those managers. But the problem is, if results get really bad and keep getting bad, and we never get going, it becomes then a ticking time bomb. If you are waiting on injuries, if you are waiting for for Luke Shaw, because the biggest grey area for United fans, and a few people have said it to me recently, when is Shaw back? When's Malasia back? Ten Hag doesn't really clarify. So we're all kind of left in the dark as to when these boys are back. Yeah, and it creates, it does create a bit of frustration because if you knew such and such a player was coming back in two weeks or three weeks, you'd be like, yeah, okay, I can, at least Affle is going to be coming back in, it'll strengthen our back four. And Luke Shaw's come back in, he lost more of a dimension out left and he's stronger going forward and he's got more, he's got more about him. Yeah, he's keeping us in the dark on that, which isn't helping. If you're saying as a style of manager, or it might be a good term as a, st- a style manager, where he sticks to one style of football, if that's the kind of guy he is, the biggest downside to that is if that style that you play doesn't work and isn't going to work, and you're going to refuse to change it, you're fucked. It's game over. I mean, if he's going to stick to the plan he's playing right now, and as you say, the results start getting worse or the results just don't pick up or only picking up a win here and there. And it's kind of a nothing season going on. He either has two choices. He gives up on the style and he adapts to the league he's in and plays what he has to play or it eventually means he will he just will fail to, fail to succeed. I, I, I do remember there was a period of Ajax. I don't remember watching it. was something I, I did a bit of research on reading about. And he had a clash with a few of the players. I think one of them was Tadic. And Ajax had a bad start to the season and there was kind of reports that we're hearing now but they all had a meeting apparently and Ten Hag kind of went back to the drawing board and changed some things and got the players all back on side so he can change I think ultimately I look at the problems that we're kind of speaking about in games kind of being slow and not having that kind of cutting edge and the killer pass there's two players that I look at that we're really missing it's Luke Shaw and Lisandro Martinez and we don't know I think Martinez I that, that could be after that is possibly after Christmas by the time he's back. We haven't heard anything again with Shaw. But I do think when we get those boys back, we're going to see a massive difference. But I also do side with what you're saying because the level of performances that we are seeing on a regular basis, you can't excuse them because they are really, really shit. And the worst team in the league, Sheffield United, we made them look a lot better. Copenhagen didn't think they were fantastic. But we make these teams look a lot better. Kind of accepted when Mourinho came in. You're going to play shit football. Park the bus, horrific to watch. But it, it's a means to an end because it's proven that it's going to be bringing the trophies. And everyone kind of was like, right, look, fair enough. He's going to come in. We're going to play shit football. And you kind of make peace to yourself and say, we're going to win all around us, which we didn't. It's kind of similar in that, that the style of football is shit. But the only thing about it is with Jose, you thought or knew there was a trophy coming behind her, a couple of trophies, because it was more play shit football but grind out a result and be kind of sneaky about it and try and get these little one nils and that that's not what we're seeing now what we're seeing now is just really really fucking poor football for 90 minutes and we might or might or might not get a goal here so i don't think fans will accept it long term i don't think anybody wants to watch I me mean, what have we played eight or nine or ten games now barring crystal palace in the cup which was the only enjoyable game to watch for 90 minutes where you were comfortable and you kind of just played played a bit of nice football and you were nice and relaxed. The rest of the games this season have been a really, really hard watch for the majority of the games. And that's not something any football fan wants to be watching every single week. So that's kind of, the, look, that's the negative Nancy side of it. But on the more positive side of it, to give Tin Haggis credit, I'm pretty sure we're, we're, like, we're both understanding that we're, we have to give the fella time. We have to let him do his job. Both fully behind the man. Don't get me wrong. I 100% believe he's going to turn it around. I'm just given the possible downsides of things went to shit. But maybe sticking to his system could work in another sense with these lads that are here at the moment in the team because once the, in inverted commas, better players come back and these boys sit back into their kind of secondary role, maybe they will be better able to come in when we, when we lose someone because we, and they play that system long term. You know, they all get, they all kind of buy into it, all get used to it. I think, I think that is the idea. I think that's yeah. the long term aim because that would have been like, and also just to touch on this, one of my criticisms, and I didn't have many last season, was that the type of football that we all were told we were going to get with Ten Hag, we seen nothing like that last season. 
there was nothing like that kind of that kind of football. Now he did make tweaks to the to the squad and the transfer market that were going to help him move on to that. And it has been just an absolute shambles that we've had so many injuries. Those players haven't all had their integration periods together. They're not all gelling together and getting used to playing with one another. It's all happening in phases, and and that's just far from ideal. But that's also football. I do think, like going back to Shaw Martinez, those two are absolutely key. And I really hope it's not way past January that Martinez is back. We're going to talk about Harry Maguire shortly, and there's a lot of hype about him at the moment, which I'm I'm just not too certain about. Before we get to that, a bit of positivity. Christian Eriksen came on at halftime. I noticed on social media people were up in arms about it. Didn't think that Amrabat should have come come off. Um, but he changed the game. What did you think of Amrabat's performance before we get to Eriksen? Amrabat has been an interesting one because he came in with a kind of a reputation. This guy's a bit of a game changer in, in style and tenacity and passing range and whatnot. Um, I've seen some rather disenchanting comparisons made with other poor footballers that he's replicating at the moment on Twitter. A couple of them were quite amusing, but he hasn't been great. He really hasn't. He got kind of shafted at the start because he ended up left back for a bit. But I just, I don't know. I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything from him really, to be honest with you. Since he came in, there's been standout by any means. Do you know what I mean? He's he's been grand. He's been all right, but he hasn't really shown anything exciting or, or any of these kind of attributes that he was promising before he came in. So maybe he's just trying to gel in and trying to get into the side, but he's not been fantastic. One of the messages we got sent in from Ty Brennan, why does it look like Amrabat is constantly tackling himself and giving away silly fouls the whole time? He looks like a shitter version of Matic. <laughs> um yeah <laughs> yeah it's a blunt take but you know what it's not far wrong i, I have to yeah. admit because yeah i don't I, he hasn't pulled up trees for me of course he was shoehorned first few games he came in but we have seen him two or three games now in midfield and look i think we had casemiro playing at the top of his peak of his levels amarback could be fine beside him but i don't think he's quick enough i think he's quite slow he doesn't cover enough ground and as Ty touches on, looks like he's tackling himself at half the time. He's had a few interesting um, tumbles, all right, in fairness, since he joined. He's just, yeah, he's a strange one. He's he just hasn't come in and been the player that that everyone was hoping and was promised that he was going to be. But again, look, give the fella time. Maybe he's going. I will say, give him one bit of praise. His passing is looks all right. In the first half against Copenhagen. His pass completion rate was impressive. When he's running around like Luke Shaw of old around the place with his little wobbly arse in him, to be, it's a bit of an acceptance to say his passing is decent, but he can't he can't do five yards of a sprint. So he's been a strange one. Yeah, he's he's not looked he's not looked amazing, but there's plenty of time for the ball man yet. <laughs> Just back to Ericsson, course responsible for assisting Maguire's goal. Can he become a starter again, or is he best kept as an option on the bench? Yeah, attacking wise, offensively, he's very 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 good. He's Passing range is brilliant. When he's on form, he get, he links up really well going forward and little one twos and, and finds that like nice little killer ball through afterwards. His delivery from set pieces is very very good, just from crossing from the wing and stuff. He's just, like he's he's probably one of our better attacking outlets passing wise than we have in the side. The problem is you trade off with Ericsson, you trade off the defense the defensive side of his game because he's absolutely a liability in defense. I mean he's. He's not at the races at all. At all, he must be completely and utterly focused on going forward because defensively he's all at sea. So I probably think the bench role is probably better for him or for us if we have someone obviously better in midfield to play at the moment. But given the fact of injuries and, and lack of form, you could argue he could get into the side because the rest of the boys aren't doing it. You know, so it's kind of a hard to call Ericsson. He's he's not getting any younger, so you're not going to expect too much more from him for a couple more seasons is just kind of get the most you can out of him for the next while I mean what, how long do you think he's going to stay for has he another year in him with us I don't know it, a lot will change if this minority state comes in because looking at some of the comments that they've picked up on in the media about Radcliffe and United's recruitment he seems fairly critical of the route they went down with signing players that were in their 30s and at the end of their careers so I think you'll see some change yeah. but but then again, I wouldn't be too quick in moving on Ericsson because one of the reasons why I wanted to ask this question about him potentially being a starter again, I, I think it's down to whether he has the legs to do it anymore and not whether he can, whether he has the ability, he definitely has. But I do think he's potentially the only real kind of, and I don't like using this term, but real baller that we have in midfield, someone that can play football, someone that knows how to dictate the tempo of the game. 
And I look in recent games, we've seen Scott McTominay start. It might seem absolutely baffling for me to go in on McTominay because he's in goal scoring form and whatnot. But in terms of football, he's so limited and it's a midfield option. And I'm looking at Mason Mount on the bench. He's got so much more football about him. And we're looking at United and we're seeing a Russian plays and why are we going diagonal with long balls to the left and to the right? Just think of Mason Mount there. He, he's a player, rather than McTominay, will be coming short, playing short passes. You know, you can then build from that. Just think things are just too much, too rushed. And maybe part of that is because one of those midfield options that we're selecting every week, I don't know, was he a second striker or what? He is half the time. But he's so limited football-wise. It's no wonder the football is so shit. I'm not putting it down to him, but it's... I think it's a big ingredient. Yeah. I find it hard to knock my Tommy ever because obviously I'm, I'm I'm quite a fan of his, but I'm yeah. also blatantly realistic. Like he doesn't have that much about him creativity wise by any means. But I think it's more uh, it's more based on him starting games, Brian. You know, like I know we've got injuries too, and, and that's playing a big part. And also the game that he started against Sheffield United, he deserved that start. Not taking that away from him. But against Copenhagen, I was a little bit surprised that. The Mount wasn't in there. I thought, okay, McTominay deserved his, his start against Sheffield United, but starting for United every every week, no, he's not good enough. No, no, not, he's definitely no, he's definitely not first choice. If we have a fully fit midfield and, and we should be firing the way we're firing, he's, he doesn't make the side at all. Definitely not. But like he's a look, give the fellow credit. He's a great, he's a great option to have in the squad and in, on the bench and that. But if we're playing well and we're playing good, expressive, dynamic football, you you have a Mount or an Ericsson in there instead for a more more creative role because. We do struggle to create. I mean, Rasmus Hoyland's feeding off scraps, to be honest about it. He's not be getting much service. Because our wingers aren't up to it at the moment. Their creative vision is probably a highfalutin term to use, but you know, they're not great. They don't look up and find like nice crisp crosses in for him to attack him. So the style of football isn't helping Hoyland either, to be fair. But we need to change something like that in the midfield to try and get that, that creative spark going because with all this pedestrian football, it's very easy for the likes of McTominay, who, as you say, is limited to just pop, pass backwards, pop, pass sideways. He's not going to take a turn and try and open the fence. You know? Certainly has a role, especially this season in the squad, because McTominay coming off the bench in a game that we need gold, we know he likes to drive into the box. And we've seen that against Brentford when he got two in stoppage time. He definitely has a role. It's just that you're watching games that he's starting in, and we've no tempo in this, at all in the first half, never get going. You have a look at the... No, no, stats don't tell you everything. But 34 minutes into the, the game against Copenhagen, it's something like 16 passes. Against Sheffield United, it's something like 16 touches in the whole game of the ball. This is a guy in midfield. He has a role to play coming off the bench. I think when he's starting, I fear the worst about teams just bypassing us in midfield and players not showing for the ball, us not dictating the tempo of the game. And it's it's rinse and repeat when he starts. And look, I don't mean to go in harsh on him. I do think he's a role, but when you're looking at Mason Mount on the bench the last two games, I don't think he played particularly bad before the international break and I hope he's back in the team for the derby at the weekend Harry Maguire is enjoying his redemption at least the media think so after three consecutive starts we are seeing signs that he's grown in confidence however the media are going a bit over the top are you sold on the idea that Harry Maguire is suddenly Manchester United standard and delighted that he didn't go to West Ham no um, I've, I've picked up on this a few times in the podcast and I've highlighted it the fickle list about Maguire this has gone back for the last few weeks before this actually exploded, but you could see it coming. Like social media, is a, it's a strange barometer to use. A couple of good games for any player in any team, and all of a sudden they're they're Maradona again. It's very very easy to turn it on. Um, though I'll, I'll give the fella his credit. He's he's kept the head down. He's stuck it out. He hasn't been an absolute arsehole into the social media or to the media in, in general. He's been he's been a one that way. A couple of rather interesting comments right when he's on England duty about his form and his percentages and stats and whatever else he gives away but hasn't caused any wins after three consecutive wins three yeah, games yeah. He started, we'll give him some credit we'll give him credit um, no look he's kept the head down it looks like he's he looks like he's taken his chance the last few games I mean he can't knock him he's been really really good but one swallow never made a summer three games don't make a comeback I guess so we need to kind of relax a small bit I mean at the end of the day when I think when Martinez comes back Himself and Vran are still the first choice pairing for me. So unless it's six wins and seven wins and nine wins, and ten wins. He deserves the credit. His problem with some of the media around this is it's like it's almost setting him up for a downfall. And you're seeing these articles, they're opinion articles, 
but they're being tailored to make it read as though it's a breaking story about how Ten Hag now has found new trust in, in Harry Maguire. It's just the writer giving his opinion that Ten Hag must trust him more. But I'd be just holding back a little bit on the hype because we're just a few days away from the Manchester Derby. It's very, very likely Harry Maguire will be starting. And you just know if there is a mistake at any point, those accounts and those mainstream media outlets, they will be the very first people to, to jump on him and to joke about him. So I'm not giving out that he's getting publicity, but I'm just saying it's what we're saying it's fake. And it's only a matter of time before it does that because that's the modern age we live in. Yeah, like hypothetically Erling Haaland goes out and scores a hat-trick off him on Sunday. He's going to get torn to shreds again instantly. Oh, it'll be back to the Maguire memes and the Maguire fail clips and the YouTube bloopers. So very, very fickle formers of temporary. We've got to be realistic. And just to throw one at you as um, one of the biggest Scott McTominay fanboys out there, giving away two penalties in recent weeks, and I'm not pinning this on him, but can you imagine the publicity had that been Harry Maguire? Yeah, he'd have been absolutely torn to shreds and all this redemption arc would be, and it wouldn't even exist, so... I wouldn't be using the word redemption. No, definitely not. <laughs> no, but look, give fair fucking play to Harry. He's 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 doing his bit. In fairness, he's he's chipping in. So cannot. No, I am happy. He's, he's doing he's doing his bit. Yeah, I look. To be fair to him, he looks a bit he looks a bit happier in himself. In fairness, so he's had a couple of good games and look good to the, see. The, good to see. The other side was it going back to the summer when there was a few instances of preseason where United fans were booing Maguire. Since then, my kind of whole thought on, on all the negativity is, I just hate the idea of someone retiring after spending a few years at this club and they'd reflect on it so negatively where they'd say, Jesus, our own fans booed him. And I know Harry Maguire, I hope he's not stupid enough to think that a few morons at a preseason game tarnished the rest of us because I certainly wouldn't do it and it doesn't happen at Old Trafford. But I am happy, of course, that there is nice stuff being written about him. I just hope that it's not totally fickle and these people are just waiting for him to, to slip. One of the things I noted, I was at the game at Sheffield at the weekend, obviously, and at the end of the game, the complete away in from top to bottom sang Harry Maguire's name when he came over to applaud everyone after the game. So mm. I suppose that's the reality that he sees on the pitch, if he's putting in a shift and he's playing well, United fans have his back and that's the end of it. You know? So we, it was nice to see our fans recognise what he's done recently because, like, again, I was at the Arsenal away game earlier in the season and when he came off the bench, the whole lot of the Arsenal fans sang his name in, in ironic applause from coming on. So it's funny how things change in football a couple of weeks later. The United fans are, are screaming his name and, and he's having a, having a bit of a purple patch. Well, the biggest difference too, and I think it's important to note, is how the abuse Harry Maguire got from Manchester United fans, supposedly, all came from pretty much social media. A lot of it was social media based, and then the Addy Powers of this world kind of jumped on it for their for their engagements. But when it comes to booing and, and finger pointing and abuse at games, he can only really put that with his time at England. And a lot of it gets made. You see some of the pundits, some of the pro-national team pundits out there. They'll pin this on United and they'll say United fans are the reason why Harry Maguire gets so much bad time. It's a mixture of the, the media that jumped on this. And I think he's got a far worse at, at England. And, and also, there was a big deal made in the media about the booze that he got during the international against Scotland. Because if you look back, that was an away game. The boos came and the jeers came from Scotland fans. It's always been part of football where football fans will take the piss out of another player. I, I, it was a big, big story made of that, I thought. And again, it just comes into this media trying to build a narrative, poor character, who again, they will jump on as soon as he falls. Andre Onana's heroics at the end led to amazing scenes at Old Trafford. A penalty save after 97 minutes to win the match. Is that enough to silence the critics? Ah, it definitely goes a long way to, to calming the, the wolves that are baying for blood. But like he's had a, he's had a really, really rocky start to his, his career at United. He's had a couple of horrors. But he was really, really good in fairness. He, he pulled off some great saves. He's penalty heroics at the end. I think you can see by the by the reaction from Hannibal Mesbury and the boys on the sideline. I don't know if you see the clip from the, 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 the bench's reaction to it. You could see how much they were delighted for him to see him pulling off that save and kind of... <laughs> Apart from Marty, yeah, sorry, I have to put that in there. He was the one player that I, I noticed in all that celebration that just looked like we'd lost. Who, who was it? 
Anthony Martial. Yeah. That fellow was probably upset when Santa Claus came down and gave him Christmas presents <laughs> on Christmas morning and walked out with a big scully hitting him. No, but it was. It was great scenes. And as well, it was reminiscent almost to uh, prior to the international break and McTominay's winner when he runs you know, the complete pitch. It was nice to see the outfield players do the same thing for him. And of course, they, they all do when you save a penalty, but it was the, the way in which this happened. At the very end, United had absolutely desperate need to win the game. They scored that penalty we're out of the Champions League. Yeah, it was massive. It was an absolutely monster moment. And it was great, it was great to see him having that moment because he needs he needs something to kickstart himself and, and jumpstart that career. Like he's come in with a massive reputation. You, you don't become a bad goalkeeper overnight. You don't become a bad footballer overnight. So it went through a really bad dip of form and, and probably confidence fell through the toilet as well. But if, if, anything, if anything's going to get a fella going, especially a keeper or something like that, it's a big, big, big moment in the season for him. He needs more. And of course, it's obviously important to get the clean sheet as well. Brian, the win means United have three points in Group A after three matches. Beating Copenhagen away from home is a must. But it also could put us in a position to clinch qualification in Galatasaray. Have you got that far where you're thinking about that? Or is your mind still cloudy with fear? Over your trip to Istanbul. <laughs> yeah, look, two unbelievable aways coming up for the European travelling Reds. Copenhagen will be a cracker. Istanbul will be something, something to experience, I guess, is the way to put it. Two it very, two tasty very... the other night with the Bayern fans. It did look a bit tasty, yeah, yeah. You know, it usually does with the old Galatasaray boys. They're, they're fond of a welcome, I suppose, but... Look, we, we'll get through Copenhagen first where hopefully we go over to, as our friend at Alternative MUFC calls them, the pastries or the Danishes. Over to the pastry boys in Copenhagen and have a few extremely overpriced pints and hopefully a nice relaxed visit to Scandinavia and then we'll worry about trying to survive Istanbul. Well, when you get to Istanbul, I hope you find a better kebab giant than the one you pulled me to in, in Munich. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, yeah, I think, I, to be fair, I think that fella stitched us up. I'm, I think I'm backing it. Because I went up taking the lead as if I was this fucking globe trotting food connoisseur. Kebab connoisseur. <laughs> yeah, kebab connoisseur. <laughs> Asked him for, for chili and the kebab, and he was like, Oh, hot chili. I was like, Yeah, yeah, how hot? And it became one of those Mexican standoffs between two alpha males. <laughs> fucking hot, mate. <laughs> So I think I think you reddened all of us afterwards out of spite. In bits for days, well, I certainly was. I could, yeah. could hardly stand the next day. Look, we're both in Manchester this weekend, so we'll be doing a podcast around the Manchester derbies. We won't dig too deep into that, and I want to get to some questions as well. But I want to get quickly, how are you feeling about the game against City? Absolutely shit in a brick, and that's being brutally honest. Like you'd always say in the season, like the City game, the Liverpool game, regardless of form and whatnot, you'd always get up for it. It's the big game and you expect the, the, the team to put on a performance. And but Jesus Christ, like we've been so poor this season. Like our, our our 90 minute performances over every game, as again, as I said, Bar Palace and the Cup have been so, so poor. Like they've been dreadful to watch. We've been making teams, again, like you mentioned earlier, Sheffield United, we've been making teams like that look a hell of a lot better than they are. Like a couple, of, I think a couple of the sides that beat us went on to get beat by far lesser sides or we will we'll call them lesser sides the following week so we're having a bad habit of making bad teams look good so I'm concerned about how good we make a good team look is I suppose how I put it at the moment because if if we don't get off get out of the block straight away on Sunday start on the right foot and start aggressive and put a boot in the cunts and let them let a marker on them they have the capabilities to absolutely fucking steamroll us and there's no point saying they don't so I'm apprehensive about it based off of what I've seen in the last number of games and how the season's going. But again, of course, being a typical football fan, today is Wednesday. Come Friday, we're easily getting a score draw. Come Sunday morning, we're winning 4-0 with Dan Gore scoring a magical hat-trick in a, in a paper by school schoolyard story. So, yeah, at the moment, I'm I'm, I'm being pragmatic and I'm being sensible but as the week goes on obviously my mind will drastically change up to Sunday when we're definitely winning. This might go against what some people are saying out there right now but I'm predicting a big game on Sunday for Marcus Rashford It's funny I've, I've seen it actually being said a couple of, by a couple of people today it's kind of like there's, it's scripted that this is the comeback for, for Rashford now when he's going to really kick on again this is the game the big game the big setting like he needs he's another player that needs something to fall right for him very very quickly because he's been fucking horrific he really has I mean I know I backed him big time recently again saying lay off him and like I'm not going to go in on him 
and say he should be dropped and he should be this and whatnot. But he has been poor. He hasn't been up to scratch whatsoever. But no more of a game for someone to write their name in the in the headlines for the following day than the Manchester Derby. Especially the fact that they're going to come utterly convinced they're going to fucking steamroll us. And I can't Just see how, how the press Sorry. are going to think any different. Sorry, I don't think the press will think any different either. The media won't think any different. They're going to expect City to do a number on us given how we're playing. And the only City haven't been... City haven't been at the top of their game. Missing Kevin De Bruyne is a massive, massive loss to that side. They haven't been pompous. can be suspended as well. They can't suspend it, yeah. They haven't been like the really taking over City either. So I just, I just, all I'm hoping all week going into this game is that we start with the right mentality and we start with the right, the right drive and effort. Like just don't go out there and fucking draw them on us for 90 minutes and try and hold on just go out and fucking stick a boot in them and go and go at them you can get at City I mean City you, they've been exposed numerous times already this season you can get at them if you go at them but the mistake you make is sit back and let them come at you and you're going to get you're going to get hurt the thing with City you mentioned the Kanji suspended Kevin De Bruyne the biggest difference between us and City is they have probably six or seven centre-backs that can come in and replace a Kanji it, it, it's no real loss for them whether it's a start or not they've just an absolute pool. And you look at our options in the past few weeks at left back, you know, non-existent. Scraping at the end of the barrel come deadline day to get in a full back who, to his credit, has been good, but has hardly been seen at Spurs for the past two years. So we really did scrape at the barrel. Now credit to, to Regulun, he at least give us a bit, a bit of shape at the back. It's nice to have an actual full back playing in the role as opposed to Victor Lindelof. But... That is the big, big difference between us and City. Suspensions, injuries, doesn't really make that big of a difference to Pep Guardiola's side. Yeah, they invest heavily in in multiple options for multiple positions. So they've achieved that with a side that's firing on all cylinders and very, very strong backer to come in when they are in, in trouble. Whereas we were, we were fucking a week away from getting Paul McShane out of, out of retirement. Actually, no, we went, we, we brought back Johnny Evans. So I suppose that takes that box, but. In fairness, Johnny and, Evans has been really good. I can't, I can't fault Johnny Evans. Same as Reggie on two of them signed yet, Dale, and there was there was head scratching going on left, right, and centre by all of us. But to be fair to them, they've been two of the better performers this season so far. So I think in the three games Evans has started, we won the three. There you go, another stat like Harry Maguire. So maybe what you were saying earlier on the podcast won't be the case. We will never see Baran and Martinez start again. And it'll be a future, a long-term future of Johnny Evans and, and Harry Maguire. Oh, Jesus Christ almighty. If I wasn't bald, I'd be going bald. No, I'd be thinking about it. <laughs> First question in from Dave Cleaver. What's your verdict on players who are out of form, but continue to start week in, week out? And I think the main culprit here he's talking about is Rashford. I'd actually go against the grain and say it's not Rashford, it's Anthony. But both are true. Out of form and replacing players out of choice. It's fine when we didn't have a massive injury crisis and we're trying to shoehorn players around the place and trying to fit things in and just trying to keep going for a while with a half-decent starting eleven. I think now as we start to see some options come back across the pitch, that should change. But then again, Eric Ten Hag is one stubborn motherfucker. He, he sticks with who he sticks with and that's the way he is. And he's, he's coming out back in Rashford and he's going to score goals. He's back in uh, Hoyland. If it wasn't Eric Ten Hag, I'd say maybe so, yes. But he's shown last season he doesn't, he doesn't fuck around with the team that much. So I can see him being stubborn and keeping him playing. I mean, how how Anthony is still getting a game, or how Anthony's getting a game. If he gets a game set Sunday, again, head scratcher. Anthony, he's, he's been horrific since he came back. Like, he's not been anywhere good. No end product. No end product. No, no end product. Like, he's it's the most confusing winger I've ever seen because he's like a winger who doesn't want to be. He gets the ball, head down, goes on the line, it's spinning around the place like a fucking, I don't know what. There's a Peter Beardsley shimmy 10 times and pass it backwards. And you're like, you fucking annoying gun. Put the ball in the box. Like, just get a cross in. And then he's he Someone tell Evan DeGeneres to cross the fucking ball. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to get the speed rating of the ball when he shoots. Because his shooting has been like a pass back more often than not. Anthony's winding the fuck out of me, to be honest with you, at the moment. I don't understand why he's playing because he's just been horrifically bad. Since he came there, he hasn't looked like an 80 million pound player, that's for fucking sure. But I haven't seen what Ten Hag must see in Anthony because he was adamant about signing him, whatever the cost. Fuck, like, I, don't, I just don't. I don't get it. I don't get Anthony. Maybe I'm missing something, but he just doesn't do it for me. Fabiola has touched on something here. She says, the results haven't been very convincing, but with the manager facing player injuries, situations off the pitch and whatnot, 
Should we be reserved on the criticism of the manager? Ten Hag is trying to build something, but you need a fit squad to do this in the right way. Do you know, I actually think we cover that in, in depth at the start. Yeah. I think I think Everton I can I gave earlier was was almost in response to that question, to be fair. So yeah, like we obviously know he needs time. We need to give him time. But we've been saying that about managers coming in too quick to change, but <laughs> You'd like to think if he's given the time that this, as I said earlier, if this style clicks and the players come back in and it starts to work and again he's achieved something good from, from the shit performance we've had the last while by getting these lads used to the system when, they, when they're needed. I think it's acceptable to give a portion of the season of a free pass as such because of the injury crisis he had to deal with. But how long that lasts, I don't know. Do you know? I think his he's, he's freedom for, for saying it's because of injuries are gone now. I mean, we need to start getting better performances out. Just to turn the question a bit more and go a bit deeper, rather than rather if or whether he will or not, do you think he does come out with this? As in, do I think he still will have a job long term? Yeah. Absolutely. What is your feeling right now? A- absolutely. Will? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't I don't even think the thought process of removing Eric Ten Hag from his job has ever crossed anyone's mind at the club at the moment. If you look back to when they did change their mind with, say, Oli, Mourinho, Van Gaal, they didn't do it quickly. It wasn't. It wasn't something that they. It wasn't knee jerk where they they jumped on it prematurely. It was. It was a long process. I think I'd be very very shocked if with everything that's going on behind the scenes at the club and take over and eyes off off the ball. Really, uh, I'd be shocked if there was any talk about that inside. I think what it also stems from there was a bogus report this week from one of the tabloids that suggested United were looking at. Graham Potter as a replacement for for Ten Hag. It was two plus two journalism. Sir Dave Brailsford apparently is a fan of Graham Potter. He could be on his way to Manchester United if Radcliffe is successful with his 25% bid. And then people are just basically joining the dots. It's dangerous journalism because it makes it a topic conversation. We're now talking about manager's future. And as you correctly pointed, Really, we know people inside the club are not even entertaining that kind of topic of conversation right now. Them kind of articles have been absolutely flown since the since the reports broke about that minority bid. I've seen Sir Jim Ratcliffe's going to come in and replace Cat on reception with fucking Laura Woods. And Sir Jim Ratcliffe's going to come in and he's definitely going to get rid of this guy, that guy, that guy, and bring in this guy, that guy. It's, it's bollocksology is what it is. It's utter rot journalism by fucking idiots who are trying to get clicks and, and likes. <laughs> Sorry, are you, are you suggesting that... Laura Woods is the modern cat. I don't know. She was signing random items of United memorabilia outside the ground last night. So there's something there. Tyg Brennan has a, a number of brilliant questions in. I think some of them we've touched on already. I want to get to this one first because between the two of us. What was the worst bit of business? Signing Anthony for £82 million pounds or signing Sancho for £75 million? Pounds? Tyg's obviously a big Anthony fan. Well, given I suppose given the fact that Jaden Sancho is currently playing football manager and FIFA and screaming at kids on headphones playing Xbox all night until four o'clock in the morning, while we pay him a very handsome wage after costing us a third world debt, he probably pips Anthony, who's just been shit. Is it fair? Yeah, but I would say that I'm not defending Anthony here. His farm has been atrocious, but when he's been out of the team, I do feel that his what he what he brings in ball retention and so on has been missing. But then saying that since he's come back into the team, he's been so non-existent. I've I've almost forgotten he's even been playing. It is a problem. I would I would go with Sancho though. I think Sancho's been one of the worst transfers in, in recent memory. I'm not just talking about United either. Yeah, he's been poor. I said it in the summer. I was hoping he'd leave. I was saying it for a, quite a while actually. To be fair, before the summer, but I had said to you numerous times like that. I I was really hoping we'd cut our losses with him in the summer. I'm not sure why we didn't, unless it was the pre-season performances that were pretty good that were kind of gave another little flash towards him, maybe turning things around, but he hasn't done it at all in the United shirt. A couple of YouTube clip goals scored for us, but other than that, nothing major. And now he's literally on the scrap heap after costing a fortune, which is going to lead to a heavy loss on transfer on what we paid for him, because any club that wants him knows we have to get rid of him. He's caused more shit for the manager who's gone through an Emmerdale-type fucking career since he joined us with weekly statements coming out with ludicrous things happening all the time around the club. He's made a bollocks out of him as well because he gave him three months off to go in and start out his mental health and, and become a happier person. And At least his assistant, Phil Mitchell, is an off to Ajax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, look, Sancho just need, it's It was an unnecessary sideline again. It's another, probably one of the, the downsides to the Sancho transfer. It became another saga we didn't need in the media. So Anthony might 
looked like a 10 million pound player an 80 million pound transfer fee but Sancho has been a, a dickhead another thing to add to that is Anthony came in the same summer as Ten Hag obviously Ten Hag had worked with him previously we, we were buying him based off what our new manager wanted don't blame the club for doing that however with Sancho we knew for some time that United were chasing him for definitely longer than a year which tells you that United were doing their scouting their homework on him for, for that period of time well you know that that that's a big difference when you spend that amount of time searching a player when, when he comes and what we've seen that really speaks volumes for staff and I think it's one of the big red red flags that Radcliffe and, and co should be looking at when they come in. They're going to be selling Sancho at some point, but I'm really looking at who's responsible for what went down there. It can't be just as simple either pointing it to the manager at the time. A lot more work is done before those decisions are made. That's another question. No goals in six Premier League matches for Hyland. He's obviously young and shown glimmers of promise. Are his performances in any way concerning? Or should we give him a free pass because he's our shiny new toy? I'll give him a free pass. A, because yes, he's a shiny new toy, of course. But we have to be realistic with that, this kid coming into the side. I touched on it earlier. The service he's been getting and the type of supply he's been living off of, it hasn't helped him whatsoever. He's not dealing with two quality wingers on top form, swinging balls at him and, and pinging balls at him all game. He's gone through large periods of matches where he literally hasn't seen the ball, hasn't touched it whatsoever. Because we've been spending so much fucking time passing it left, right, and, and forward and back. I think he needs he needs a long time to get into this side. I mean, I was nervous about the kid coming in. I've said it a few times. The pressure he's under is phenomenal. Taking up that, that main role striker for United. He needs time, 100%. The team in general is playing shit. Very hard for him to light up the room when, when everyone around him isn't playing very well. So, the style of football hasn't helped him. The performances haven't helped him. I just think I just think he's been a victim of us being absolutely shit for a couple of weeks. And when he came into the side, it's not like he came into the side that's firing, firing all cylinders and creating a load of chances for him. You know? I actually think he's been a shining light. Really do. Watching him and watching some of the phases of playing, he's not getting a lot of service. But little things like how he uses his strength against defenders and his pace and to get in behind. And it's almost like some of the opportunities in which he has created, he's created them himself. He's able to run with the ball and factor in his age, 20 years old. Yeah, okay, he's not banging in the goals right now. But when we spent a lot of money on him in the summer, and a lot of fans didn't have a clue who he was, and even from looking at his previous stats, we weren't signing an elite striker. What I believe we have signed is someone who will become an elite striker. I think he's been, I think he started really well, of course. You can't overlook the, the Premier League stat six games and no goals. In Europe, much better. Three games, three goals. But I think it's all around play and his presence. So you have to look at the ones around them and are they providing the service? Because I see this bully-like striker willing to slide onto the end of the ball in the box, but I don't see those low crosses into the box. You know, I looked at Rashford the other night, crossed the ball in once at all, at any point. Granacho came on and it wasn't as if these players are not being told not to cross because he did attempt one. I just don't know where it is because... Hyland looks to me like a striker that's just going to feed on that kind of service. Goals, goals, goals. They will come. I have liked what I've seen from him so far. Tyke has a bonus question as well. Was it a bad decision to let Fred go? Personally, I think he offers more than Mount and Amrabat. I'll give him Amrabat currently because Amrabat hasn't looked anywhere decent. Um, Mason Mount is definitely a better footballer than Fred. Be realistic. I mean, I know, I know we all have our favourites, Tyke, and we all think... Some of us were McTominay, some of us were Fred in that never-ending battle of which was of the McFred, which was the shitter one. But Fred is Fred's left United and, and won and got three points every week and tweeted about it and it's me up to see it every fucking week. Yeah, he's after getting into Tyg's mind because we've been so shit this season. And when Tyg is logged into Twitter, he's obviously seen all these posts from Fred winning all these fucking games and no, it's, it's no wonder that it's what we're missing right now. Well, we're definitely missing winning loads of games and three points tweets every week instead of the whole. <laughs> so, so, sorry, we'll try better. But no, um, I was by no means upset to see Fred leave. I'm still not sure what Mason Mount's transfer is going to be all about long term. But Mason Mount is definitely a better all-around footballer and a better option for us. Two more questions before we wrap up. Damien Young says, coffee dates with the hair, innocent or an unwelcome distraction? I don't see anything wrong with it whatsoever. Um, I mean, he's left the club after 
years and years there. He's obviously very close to all these lads. I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, what I did see point out actually more so, or, or notice more so, what a fucking life Tom Heaton has. What a life he's after hitting on. Chilling with the boys, some of the best footballers around, aim with the gang, getting paid a small fortune to do it, and he has to do absolutely fucking nothing to earn any of it. He's hit the Lee Grant bonus wall winner here. He's just chilling with the, the lads. Ah, oh, fuck it. What a, li- what a nice guy. Like, Tom Heaton's a cool guy. He's a, he's, a, he's a nice guy by all accounts, but he's living the dream. <laughs> Cruising <laughs> around with Bruno and David De Gea and the boys having the crack, drinking coffees, and doing fucking nothing to earn it. Good man, Tom. I think the only problem with De Gea and the coffee dates is there was a story a few years ago, wasn't there, when he forgot to pay for the, the donut or when left you the... When he tea leafed a few donuts out of the shop. <laughs> so the only problem I see with that is if any of the lads are expecting De Gea to, to pay for, for what they get in the coffee <laughs> shop because <laughs> they, they, they won't be seen as sent. Another one more question from, from Dave Cleaver. I know he asked where you're on but it's a nice one to finish up on. How do we line up against City on Sunday? Like a fucking brick wall. (laughs) (laughs) 11 across the goals. How do we line up? It is a good question. And one that I think would bring quite a lot of thought into trying to overthink it and second guess Pep. But just fucking, I don't know, just just play. Eric, play the 11 fellas do you think give a shit the most? Because other than that, we're fucked. Play the, the 11 boys that you think are going to put in the hardest shift they possibly can and give absolutely everything they have for 90 minutes. And whoever that may be, I'm happy with it. Because if we go out there and we play this pukey fucking Van Gaal style football, again, that we've seen all season, we're in serious trouble. I'm expecting Casemiro and Mount to come in. Onana at the back goal. Back four selects itself in Dallo, Varane, Maguire and Regulun. In midfield... Casemiro comes back in, like I said. Amrabat alongside him. Randes, obviously, and Mason Mount. Mount in instead of Anthony. And the top two, Rashford and Hyland. That's what I'd be going for the weekend. Pack that midfield. Definitely get Mason Mount in there, like I alluded to earlier on the podcast. I'm not saying that that's the missing ingredient that will see us Pip City at the weekend. But it will certainly bring more football. And we're going to be doing lots of chasing against City. I do think Mount's someone that will work. I'm not saying he's the greatest defensively, but he will work. He won't go hiding. The only one, even though we're saying this is the scripted one for Rashford to, to light it up, I think Garnacho has a big shout. I think he's a big claim for it. I know I probably won't get the start, but I've enjoyed Garnacho coming off the bench. He's shown so much more energy and so much more willingness to, to work his bollocks off and try create than Rashford has when, he, when he's been playing. So we kind of hamper Garnacho with kind of like a sub role coming in making making the greatest effect he can as a kind of a cameo role or, or a relief after 60 minutes. And when he starts games, he hasn't traditionally been as effective. But fuck me, he's a, he's a little live wire. Do you know, I just I, I really, really like Garnacho. I really like watching him. I'd like to see him up against City. Now, if Rashford starts, he's not doing it after 50, 55, 60 minutes. Get him on early and let, let's see what he can do, depending on how the game is going, obviously. Mounting for Anthony, I wouldn't disagree with it at all. I don't think Anthony can start the weekend. I don't think he's done anywhere near enough to warrant a place in the side for the weekend. So I take him out there, yeah. And it also means Bruno Fernandes doesn't have to go out right because I can't stand watching that either. It's fucking horrific. Piling up front, yeah. yeah. I think the that's pretty much pretty much the team I'd expect, yeah. The only one again, Amrabat. Have, have we seen enough for him to demand him to start on Sunday again? I, th- I think demand, defensively, but... though, I think we have to. Because, it, you know, we're saying we're bringing Casemiro in. We can't forget Casemiro's form this season. Yeah, it's fair. Yeah, yeah. Casemiro hasn't exactly been amazing either. So I suppose you play the two side by side and hope they can hold off the marauding city midfield coming at us. So that's another episode wrapped up. You'll be hearing from us again. Possibly Monday we'll get the next episode out. But thanks again for listening. Thanks again for all your questions. Brian, quickly, how can people follow you on social media and keep up to date with your travels? If you're sadistic enough to want to follow my nonsense on Twitter, it's at DateDrippingRed. You can follow Stretty News at Stretty News, of course. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And of course, just a final message. Say rest in peace to Robbie Charlton. And we're all sending our condolences and love at this difficult time to his family. (laughs) 